lovers and fellow Civil War enthusiasts. On behalf of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, producer of the 2015 Virginia Festival of the Book, and the University of Virginia, welcome to this session, Women of the Civil War, Uncovering Their Lives and Letters. I'm Professor Irvin Jordan, panel moderator and research archivist here in the Small Special Collections Library. I also invite you to visit our upstairs main floor exhibition, Who Should Tell the Story? Voices of Civil War Virginia. This afternoon's panel of three distinguished scholars exemplifies innovative scholarly scrutiny of Civil War women's lives and labors. A century and a half after Appomattox, the war remains gender stereotyped as a white male macho experience. <laughs> its historiography needs and benefits from the works of our scholars as women's studies continues to move from the sidelines to the forefront of American history. But first, the obligatory festival guidelines and paperwork. Please silence all cell phones. <laughs> Tweet about this event at hashtag VA book. I'm just reading from a script here. <laughs> Please tweet about this at hashtag VA book 2015. The festival is free of charge, not free of cost. So please remember to go online and give back or pick up a giving envelope from the information desk at the Omni Hotel and support the festival so we may sustain it for many, many more years. Please fill out a program evaluation because these provide useful information that keeps the festival free and open to the public. And these are now available online at vabook.org slash program dash evaluation. Please support our festival authors and our local booksellers by purchasing a book or books today. Now, having gotten that out of the way, well, I'm just, as I said, I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading from a script, so <laughs> what can I tell you? But we'll, we'll work it out if it's not right. We'll get it right for you. Male prerogatives in antebellum America constrain women by placing them on pedestals of adoration and subordination in the traditional roles of wife and mother, sister and daughter. Yet during the war, women experienced more tumultuous societal changes than their militarized menfolk. For the first time, many took jobs outside the home and were provisionally liberated as wage employees or managed businesses or farms in the absence of their men. Women of all classes encouraged their soldiers' martial and marital morale in a vast outpouring of writings, thousands of which survived unpublished. Our trio of speakers will offer insightful perspectives of these remarkable women's stories. Um, introducing the first speaker, Ms. Karen Abbott, author of Liar, Temptress, Soldier Spy, Four Women Undercover in the Civil War. Uh, she's the New York Times bestselling author of Sin in the Second City and American Rose. She also contributes to the Smithsonian Magazine history blog Past Imperfect and writes for Disunion, the New York Times series about the Civil War. Dr. Carolyn Curry, author of Suffer and Grow Strong, The Life of Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas, 1834 to 1907, holds a BA in English from Agnes Scott College and a PhD in history from Georgia State University. She has taught at the Westminster Schools in Atlanta and at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Curry is the founder and chair of Women Alone Together, a nonprofit foundation for women. Professor Casey Claybor is the editor of Virginia of Women of War Memoirs, Poetry, and Fiction by Virginia Women Who Lived Through the Civil War, and author of School, Life Lessons of a College Professor. He is a former Virginia Foundation for the Humanities Fellow. He is also the series editor of the forthcoming 12-volume Best Creative Nonfiction of the South, the Virginia volume of which will be published this fall. Each author will have 15 minutes uh, for their presentations. After the end of uh, the, all three presentations, we will have audience questions and answers. And so we will begin this afternoon's program with Ms. Abbott. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jordan. Uh, thank you, uh, Carolyn and Casey, for joining me here today, and thank you all for coming out today. It's really great to be back in Virginia. I spent quite a bit of time here researching my book, Liar, Tempter, Soldier, Spy. Uh, really quickly, my favorite research anecdote was going to the 150th uh, anniversary uh, reenactment of the first battle of Bull Run, Manassas, uh, in 2011. Um, where I really admired the attention to historical detail, and yet the anachronisms couldn't help but slip in. Um, I was sitting in front of a man with his 10-year-old son, and the man kept saying, son, look, there's Stonewall Jackson by the power lines. 
Anyway, uh, I usually start off by talking about how I became interested in the Civil War. Um, I was born and raised in Philadelphia and moved to Atlanta in 2001, where I realized fairly quickly, you know, they're still fighting the Civil War down there. Mm -hmm. um, I had to get used to seeing the occasional Confederate flags on the lawn, uh, hearing jokes about the War of Northern Aggression. And the point was really driven home for me one day when I was sitting in traffic on Route 400, um, sitting behind a pickup truck with a, a bumper sticker that said, don't blame me, I voted for Jeff Davis. Um, I was stuck in traffic behind this bumper sticker for two hours and <laughs> therefore had quite a bit of time to really think about the Civil War um, and, and the way it, it uh, and, and you know, my mind always goes to, well, what were the women doing? And not just any women, but what were the, the bad women doing? What were the defiant women doing? Um, and I was really interested to find four women, two for the North, two for the South, who lied, seduced, wheedled, plundered, spied, drank, avenged, stole, and murdered their way through the war. And, and I'm hoping that I, I manage to do that. Um, and without further ado, I'll, I'll just introduce my four lady spies. Um, the first was Belle Boyd, um, who was 17 years old and living in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, when the war broke out. And Belle was one of my favorite characters. Uh, she was all id. She had absolutely no reservations about anything, um, in, including her feelings about herself. Uh, just to demonstrate that, I'm going to read a very brief clip of a letter she sent to her cousin, uh, she was lobbying him to find her a husband. I am tall, Belle wrote. I weigh 106 and a half pounds. My form is beautiful. My eyes are a dark blue and so expressive. My hair of a rich brown and I think I tie it up nicely. My neck and arms are beautiful and my foot is perfect. <laughs> Only wear size two and a half shoes. My teeth the same pearly whiteness, I think perhaps a little whiter. Nose quite as large as ever, neither Grecian nor Roman, but beautifully shaped. And indeed, I am decidedly the most beautiful of all of your cousins. Um, so Belle clearly had no uh, issues with self-esteem. Um, and, and she was very overt with both her opinions and her sexuality, which was very rare for a 17-year-old girl during this time period. Um, I like to say that if uh, Sarah Palin and Miley Cyrus had a 19th century baby, it would have been Belle Boyd. <laughs> So, so Belle kicks things off in 1861 in July. Um, Union forces had just won a small skirmish at, near the Shenandoah Valley, and they're marching up the valley, and they're planning on having a big 4th of July celebration in her hometown of Martinsburg, Virginia. It's West Virginia today, but at the time it was still Virginia. Um, and they enter Martinsburg, and they start ransacking homes and stealing liquor and causing all sorts of trouble. And a group of soldiers approach Belle's home, and one Union man threatens to raise a federal flag over her home. Belle, being the cool, common, collected sort, decides to shoot this fellow dead. And she gets away with it. She claims self-defense and gets away with it, and is really emboldened by the fact that she gets away with it. And she taps into her vast network of Confederate con uh, connections. She has many family, friends, and relatives in the Confederate Army. And she decides to become a courier and, and sort of want wannabe spy, I should say. Um, and Belle um, has many adventures and, and goes on uh, to uh, be particularly adept at seducing men. Um, she was a notorious seductress. She did not discriminate uh, north, south, uh, you know, didn't matter the rank. Um, I filed this under things I can't make up. This is why I love nonfiction. One of her reported paramours was a man by the name of Major Dick Long. Um, <laughs> I always feel like a 12-year-old boy telling that joke. Um, <laughs> But she, uh, so men loved Belle, needless to say, um, but women did not like Belle very much. They had several nicknames for her. One of them was the fastest girl in Virginia, or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and she would go on to have several uh, great adventures during the war that I write about in the book. Uh, my second spy is uh, uh, Private Frank Thompson. Um, and Private Frank Thompson comes into the war with a bit of a secret. Private Frank Thompson was actually a woman named Edma Edmonds and had been living as a man for two years. Um, and Emma Edmonds had a really interesting background. She was born and raised in Canada and uh, was fleeing an abusive home situation. Her father decided he was going to marry her off to an, an elderly neighbor, a farmer, um, and her whole life was going to be dedicated to, you know, uh, tending to this husband's farm. And she wanted no part of that. She was an adventurous sort. So one night she decided, she's about 18, 17 years old at this point, cuts her hair, binds her breasts, um, trades in her women's dress for a man's suit and begins calling herself Frank Thompson. 
and she migrates to the United States, where she becomes an itinerant Bible salesman, and she begins hearing about the abolitionist John Brown and the drumbeat of events leading up to the Civil War, and decides she wants a piece of that. And so in the spring of 1861, she's in Detroit, Michigan, and she enlists in the Union Army in the, in the Second Michigan. And you might ask, well, how did she get away with it? How did she not only uh, pass the medical examination, um, but how did she fool all of her comrades? Um, and I should say that Emma was about one of an estimated 400 women who disguised themselves as men from North and South um, who disguised themselves and fought in the war. Um, and I came to the conclusion that these women mostly got away with it because nobody knew what a woman would look like wearing pants. You know, people were so used to seeing women's bodies pushed and pulled into exaggerated shapes with corsets and crinolines that the very idea of a woman wearing pants, um, let alone an entire army uniform, was so unfathomable uh, that even if she were standing in front of you, you, you might not realize it. So uh, Emma was quite adept at this, and she had been living as a man for two years, so she had the mannerisms all honed. Um, and so she had trouble on several fronts. You know, she was participating in some of the bloodiest battles of the war as a nurse and a courier, an occasional spy. Um, and she also had to worry about being discovered. She could be arrested. She could be charged with prostitution. And worst of all for Emma, she would be kicked out of the army, and she definitely didn't want that. So she goes along, and everything's going fine, until a little wrench gets thrown into her path. Um, a very handsome wrench by the name of Jerome Robbins, uh, who was a fellow soldier with the 2nd Michigan. And Emma unexpectedly falls in love with Jerome Robbins. Uh, and one of my greatest research uh, discoveries was Jerome Robbins' diary in Michigan, where he would say, have entries that said things like, there's something funny about my friend Frank Thompson. I can't quite put my finger on it, but a mystery seems to be connected with him. Uh, so, uh, you know, Emma has a decision to make. Does she keep everything to herself and sort of lay low and play it safe? Or does she risk everything and tell Jerome who and what she really was and let the chips fall where they may? Um, and so I had a lot of fun chronicling their, their love story in the book. Uh, my third spy is Rose O'Neill Greenhow, uh, who might be familiar to some, some people in this room. Um, Rose uh, was another interesting woman. She was a, a Confederate woman living in the federal capital of Washington, D.C., and her whole life had fallen apart in the years leading up to the war. Uh, she had lost five children in four years, if you can imagine that. She lost her husband in a freak accident. And she had lost her access to the White House. Uh, she's somebody who had been friends with high-ranking Democratic politicians for years leading up to the war. She'd even been an advisor with, uh, to President James Buchanan and lost all of this power and access when Lincoln and the Republicans uh, won and came into to power in D.C. And so Rose was desperate to get a, any a piece of her old life back. So in the spring of 1861, when a Confederate captain approached Rose and asked her to organize and run an espionage ring in, the, in Washington, D.C., uh, she jumped at the chance, um, and she began cultivating sources. Uh, by cultivating, I mean seducing. Um, she was another notorious seductress. And one of her most important paramours was a man by the name of Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, who was not only an abolitionist Republican, but Lincoln's chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs. Um, so you can imagine that they had uh, quite lucrative pillow talk, and Rose made great use of that. Um, and I had uh, great fun learning about her spy craft, just to give you a taste of that. Um, she did have a cipher that she labored over and memorized and, and used whenever she could, including during the first battle of Bull Run. Maybe I could talk about that later. Um, but she also memorized the Morse code. Um, and if the, there might be Confederate scouts who, at certain appointed times, were told to look at her windows, and she could raise and lower the blinds according to the dots and dashes of the Morse code. Um, she also sewed messages into the, in tapestry work in certain colors according to the Morse code. Um, so, so a lot of really crafty spy work on her part. My final spy, and one of my favorites also, is Elizabeth Van Lu who was sort of the opposite of Rose Greenhow. She was a Union spy living in the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. And whereas Rose was outspoken and brazen and very bold, Elizabeth was really quiet and cautious and discreet. Um, and whereas Rose was this celebrated beauty, everybody always raved about Rose's beauty. Uh, Elizabeth, according to one of her contemporaries, uh, was, quote, never as pretty as her portrait showed. <laughs> Rare. <laughs> it was kind of poor Elizabeth. Um, but Elizabeth was a, a brilliant, brilliant woman. She was born and raised in Richmond, so she was a, a Southerner. And she was sent north to Philadelphia to be educated. And while she was there, came under care of an abolitionist governess. And when she returned to Richmond, she brought those ideals back with her. And she was quite horrified at the institution of slavery and, and decided she was going to do something about it. 
Um, and it was very dangerous. Well, I should say before the war, um, people just thought Elizabeth was an oddity, this sort of benign spinster. She never married. She lived with her mother in this mansion in Churchill, this most uh, uh, prestigious section of Richmond. Um, but after the war broke out, it was very dangerous for her to be known as an outspoken abolitionist, for her opinions to be out there. Um, she received death threats almost on a daily basis. Um, she was followed by Confederate detectives wherever she went. Um, but nevertheless, Elizabeth went through with her plans to organize a Union espionage ring in the Confederate capital of Richmond. And she began, uh, she began uh, recruiting people from all walks of life for this. Uh, one of them was her brother, John Van Loo. And John Van Loo, I had the great pleasure of connecting with uh, descendants of John Van Loo. Uh, he had two daughters, and I spoke with the great-grandson of one of these daughters, um, who gave me um, some, some information about her incredible espionage ring that had never been published before or spoken about before. And just to give you a brief taste of that, um, he used the family's hardware business in his espionage ring. Um, and he would take blank invoices and purchase orders and fill them out as if they were normal business documents, but every number he wrote down corresponded to certain military terminology. For example, 370 iron hinges might mean 3,700 cavalry. 30 anvils might mean 30 batteries of artillery, and so on. So if he was going through the lines and the rebel uh, sentries looked at his paperwork, they wouldn't see anything, but he'd be able to translate and give the Union authorities the proper information once he made it to northern lines. Um, but I have to say, Elizabeth's most uh, ingenious uh, coup in terms of her espionage ring was placing a former family slave in the Confederate White House as a spy. Um, after Elizabeth's father died, she freed all of the family slaves. The Van Loos did have slaves, and, and many of them stayed on to work with the Van Loos for pay after they were freed. Um, and there was one in particular that Elizabeth took a liking to. Her name was Mary Jane Bowser. So it was uh, fall or late in 1861 where uh, Verena Davis, the first lady of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis is white, put out a call that she needed help. She was staffing the Confederate White House. She needed servants. So Elizabeth paid her a visit and said, I have a girl for you. She's not very bright. She stumbles in the kitchen, but she'll be loyal and she'll serve your purposes. And she sends over Mary Jane Bowser. Now, little does anybody know that Mary Jane Bowser is not only literate, but highly educated and gifted with a photographic memory. So while she's dusting Jefferson Davis's desk and putting the kids' toys away in the nursery, she's also sneaking peeks at the papers on his desk and eavesdropping on confidential conversations and reporting all of this back to Elizabeth. Um, and to make matters even more dangerous, John Van Loo was married to an ardent Confederate sympathizer, um, and they were all living in the same house in Richmond. This was going on all under this woman's nose, and she would not have hesitated to report even her husband um, if she suspected any of them for treasonous activity. Um, so that, that's it for me. <laughs> but thank you. Okay, how do you follow that act? <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, no, I'm going to tell you about a woman you've never heard of named Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. She was from the state of Georgia. She did not live nearly as colorful a life, but... Her life was transformed by the Civil War, as so many women's lives were transformed by the Civil War. Um, briefly, she was born into one of the wealthiest families in the state of Georgia, even in the South. Her father, she was born in 1834, and she was born in Augusta, Georgia, and her father, Turner Clanton, owned 12,000 acres of land, six plantations, 393 slaves, warehouses in the city of Augusta, rental property, and he had made a fortune on the back of slave labor um, and made Augusta, Georgia, into the second largest inland cotton port in the world. Um, today, what do you think of Augusta, Georgia for? Goth. <laughs> yes, all of that is gone. Um, but before the Civil War, Augusta was known as this very wealthy city. And in the state of Georgia, still today, you can hear somebody, if something good happens to you, somebody will say, why, you must have cotton in Augusta. <laughs> but uh, so it, it still lingers, that memory of how Augusta was such a rich uh, city before the war. But this young girl, uh, born in 1834 in this very wealthy family, had beautiful clothes, jewelry, uh, leisure, and because she had these slaves waiting on her. 
And she took her life for granted because she was her father, whom she adored, condoned slavery. Uh, she talks about in her diary that she started keeping when she was 14 years old about going to hear Alexander Stevens, um, the congressman from Georgia, saying that slavery, the battle over slavery has been won by the South. It is the best institution for both black and white. And she buys into it um, and accepts it. But in this diary that she started keeping when she was 14 years old and kept for 40 one years, if you can believe it. And if you've ever tried to keep a diary, that was difficult. Uh, but she um, was very honest in her diary and very straightforward. And many of the Civil War diaries that women wrote, such as Mary Boykin Chestnut, they knew their diaries were going to be published, and they edited them for publication. But this woman thought her diary was being written for her children, and uh, she didn't think anybody would ever read it. And that's another thing that makes me happy, that this woman that died uh, over 100 years ago, we are reading her diary and talking about it, a very valuable source. It is at Duke University um, in their archives. It is 13 volumes, 450,000 words. Um, so I took that diary, uh, a typed transcript of that diary, and poured over it literally for several years when I was doing my doctoral dissertation. This young lady not only had the advantage of the great wealth and leisure, she had a father in a time when most men thought women did not need education. He recognized that his daughter was brilliant, and he decided to send her to the new college for women in Macon, Georgia, called Wesleyan Female College, starting in 1836, and it is the oldest college for women in America. And they are very proud of this woman, uh, Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas. So she goes there and loves it. She thrives. And she graduates when she's 17 years old. I have a chapter in the book about what early education for women was like. It was very strenuous. They had to get up very early, and they had to go to chapel, and they had to recite and all of that. But it was an opportunity for her. And she loved the women that she met there. And you can see a beginning of her investigation of life. She's asking questions. She wants to understand women's station and why the way the world is the way it is. Um, she graduates when she's only 17 years old. So it was something like an advanced prep school. But it was still better than most women had at that time. Gertrude looks back on her life later in the diary, and she says when she left Wesley, and that's when her troubles began. She got married. <laughs> She accepted her destiny, as all women, most women, other than these women, uh, in the 19th century accepted her destiny that she was to be married and bear children. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply, and that's what she started doing. The first year, she was, she was married at 18. At 19, she had her first baby. The second year, she had a premature baby, and that baby died. A few months later, she has a miscarriage. Then uh, the next year, she has a baby that goes full term, and that baby dies after three months. And then her fifth pregnancy is successful. She's 24. This was what all women in the 19th century that accepted their destiny to be fruitful and multiply experienced. Ella Gertrude Clanton Thomas's diary probably leaves us the best record of what women went through in childbirth and the great suffering that they went through. She will eventually give birth to 10 children and four will die. Her mother had 11 children and four died. Um, and all the women um, went through this. And as I say, she's, this was her first form of suffering, what she suffered in childbirth. And what, this is something that she shared with all women of the time. Now, the second suffering 
that she experienced, obviously, is the Civil War. Um, I have spoken like 75 times in the last year um, around the state of Georgia and the South in the celebration of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. And in our state, everywhere you go, you hear stories of Sherman's march to the sea. And um, I say, just imagine 100,000 troops entered the state of Georgia in May, 150 years, 1864. And by September, after fighting all through North Georgia, they took Atlanta and burned Atlanta that was memorialized in that famous movie, Gone with the Wind, and then went to Savannah, marching through the state, burning, destroying farms, Sherman's goal was to demoralize the South and convince them that they could not win the war. And it was the women that were left there alone to meet Sherman and the troops. And so everywhere I've gone, women have told me stories in their family uh, that have come down to them about Sherman and the atrocities that happened to their family and the fear and the anxiety. Well, Gertrude Thomas is in Augusta, Georgia, which is north of Savannah. Sherman rests his troops for a month, and then he starts marching north toward Augusta. And she describes the fear and anxiety that they all felt. She was speaking for all women. And she said, I cry sometimes, and then I laugh sometimes. And she tried to pack up valuables, and she decided that she would pack her diary instead of the silver. And aren't we glad she did? <laughs> now, during the Civil War, she had two more babies because her husband bought a substitute, came home for $300. He paid a man in Maryland to um, fight for him. And so as a result, she had two more babies. But it's very moving in the book when you see that her babies survived because her slave women helped her. And she could not nurse her babies. Her milk was not good, and her, they tried cow's milk and goat's milk. But when her slave women started nursing her babies, they survived, and she felt nothing but gratitude. And she brings the slave women babies into their house and tries to save the ones that are sick. And she fights with her husband when he tries to send the slave women out to work in the fields late in their term. So you see a wonderful new sensitivity in this woman of privilege. And she bonds with her slave women and becomes very sensitive to what is happening to them. Um, and that unfolds so well in the diary. So her second form of suffering is the Civil War the economic difficulties that are occurring. They start having economic difficulties. Her husband's not a good businessman like her father had been. And he is not able to cope with the aftermath of the defeat of the war. And there's so many historical studies that have been done about how the men went into deep depression, started drinking after the war, and Jeff Thomas is one of the ones that they very often study because she could never bring him out of his depressions. But here is this woman who's lost all these babies, and she has lost this great wealth in her family. And what does she do? She starts a school in her home, and she makes $30 a month, and she itemizes every penny in her diary because she's trying to buy clothes for her daughters that she, her daughters don't have the beautiful clothes that she had. And she gets the white knit gloves mended. And it's just really, you know, she's counting every penny. It's sure she wants to help the family to survive. And then they turn the old 24-room mansion into a boarding house with loss of privacy and pride. And she's willing to do whatever she can to, to help the situation. Uh, very often she's compared to Scarlett O'Hara. People are always coming up to me saying, oh, uh, she looks like Scarlett O'Hara, and she had that same grit. She had that same determination. I said, yes, but she had a conscience, too. Uh, she, wa she wanted to do the right thing. She wanted to do the honorable thing. 
And as I say, she was always investigating her life and trying to do the right thing. And I've got one minute to tell you that this miraculous woman moved to Atlanta in 1893 after they'd lost everything in Augusta. And she joined the early suffrage movement and threw herself into getting education for women, the vote for women. And in 1899, she was elected the first president of the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association. And she stood up and said before hundreds of people that woman was not taken from the head of man, she is not his superior. Woman was taken not from the foot of man, she's not his inferior. But woman was taken from the side of man, and there she should stand his equal in the work of the world. <laughs> uh, and this was 1899, 21 years before the vote uh, for women, and, but she dared to ask for equality. So we should remember this woman. There were women like this in the South. Mm-hmm. The germination uh, for this book, Women of War, Virginia Women, writing from Virginia women that that lived through the Civil War, had its germination um, right here. Or rather, not right here, but behind us in Alderman. So I I, I thought I would start with that. Once upon a time, there was a young uh, Southern novelist back in the 60s who was on his way to Washington, D.C., to do some research. And uh, at the time, the chair of the English department at UVA was a man, a textual scholar, some of you will find the name familiar maybe if you're from around here, named Fredson Bowers. And uh, his reaction was basically, uh, you know, why can't we get some New Yorker writers here? Why are we getting this Southern novelist to stop by? And uh, as, it, as it turned out, the Southern novelist's name, he's actually a very good novelist, even though you, you probably don't know him that way, uh, was Shelby Foote. <laughs> and uh, Karen and I actually shared a little joke before, uh, before the panel, because she asked me, how did you get a blurb on your book <laughs> from Shelby Foote? You know, I didn't pry open his crypt. But uh, as it turns out, one of Fredson Bauer's students was a person, and the name may also uh, sound familiar, named Matthew Bruckley, who would go on to have uh, a very distinguished career as a bibliographer and a book collector um, and a uh, literary representative for the F. Scott Fitzgerald estate. So fast forward to the 1990s. I'm a graduate student looking for dissertation ideas, uh, Dr. Bruckley, who's familiar with the holdings at what was then the Alderman Special Collections, and who had met Shelby Foote as he passed through Charlottesville on his way to Washington, D.C., said, you know, there's all this magnificent material on uh, Virginia women uh, in Special Collections in Alderman, and, you know, I, I'm going to get you in touch with Shelby Foote. So long story short, I began this project, and um, 12 books uh, later, I resumed it. So I abandoned it (laughs) at the time, went on, did my dissertation on, on something else, but decided to come back to it as a result of a novel I had written called uh, Confederados, or Confederado, which is about the Confederate migration to Brazil following uh, the Civil War. And one of the things that that happened while I was promoting that book is I would go around to roundtables and and Civil War societies and find that, um, to bring up uh, Irvin's earlier remarks, it was predominantly, uh, you know, a male-dominated scene. There might be women there, but typically they'd been dragged there by their husbands. And um, so that, that really kind of motivated me uh, and got me thinking, you know, that there's this whole readership out there uh, that's interested in the Civil War or at least 
being made to listen to people talk about the Civil War. And, um, you know, th there's really not a lot of subject matter that's of interest uh, to them. You know, it's basically speeches about campaigns and generals and that sort of thing. So I decided to, to finish this research, to complete this book, and that, that's, the, that's the story of how Women of War came back. And being, uh, coming from uh, the English side of things, from the literary studies kind of things, and in, in viewing these primary works as an editor, uh, there, were, there were a couple of factors that I had to deal with. One was that, um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm male, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm framing these female uh, narratives, so how, how, how do I go about that? And so I didn't feel confident enough to write, um, you know, to try to attempt a book like, like Karen's, where you're actually creating narratives uh, based on historical fact with these women. So I wanted it to be uh, their voices coming to the forefront. The other thing I did was get um, or ask a couple of contemporary Virginia writers to uh, write a forward, an epilogue for the book, and Carrie Holiday who is a uh, novelist from Richmond, uh, wrote the uh, forward, and Charlotte Matthews, who's a, a very talented uh, poet, uh, graduate of, of the university, uh, graduate program, who lives in Crozet, wrote the afterward. And so I felt a little better about that after, after I got their reactions. They, they thought it was a good, a good thing to do. Um, and also leaving it in the voices of, of the women uh, themselves. Now, having said that, the book is divided into, into three portions. It's divided in, into memoir, uh, poetry, and fiction. And I, I would say that um, the most interesting and, and probably the, the, the closest, um, the section that came contains the most verisimilitude is the creative nonfiction portion. And sort of, sort of like Karen's topic, these are women that were simply writing their diaries, uh, recording what was happening on a daily basis, and essentially seeing their, seeing their state systematically um, taken apart. You know, Virginia often is, is mentioned, referenced as the, the the battlefield of the Civil War, at least as far as the Eastern Theater is concerned. Um, but then with that came a sort of agency, and, and also this kind of goes along with, with Carolyn's point about um, you know, th this woman eventually becoming a suffragist. Because you know, who, was, who was doing the taxes? Who, who, or who was making the financial decisions? Who was suddenly having to um, deal with livestock? And you know, who suddenly had agency to make all these decisions that they previously hadn't possessed? So it's kind of a paradox in a way that, where you have these Virginia women who are, who are suffering, but you know, at the same time are privy to this, this, this kind of freedom that they've never experienced uh, before. And you can really feel that in the, in the memoir portions of the writing. I feel like the, the fiction and the poetry is more elegiac and more of that period in terms of being, um, you know, flowery, rhyming kinds of um, couplets. But I wanted to read a, a, a brief portion of a piece from a woman named uh, Mrs. Pryor. She was a woman of advantage. Her husband was a friend of, of um, or an officer under Robert E. Lee. And so the setting for this occurs at uh, Petersburg. So it's, it's uh, near, near the end of, of the war, and uh, it's, it's spring. It's, it's actually uh, around this time. When, when she's writing this, 100 and, 150 years ago. And uh, being owning a farm on Appom in Appomattox myself, uh, I, I think that uh, it's an appropriate place to read considering that Appomattox is, is mentioned. So she's in, she's in camp. Um, she's living near camp, rather. General Lee has just returned from Richmond, 
where he's been informed that the army can't be supported. And so here's, here's her reaction to that. And General Lee has just allowed her husband to be exchanged. I was too much overcome to do more than stammer a few words of thanks. Lee said, what are you going to say when I tell you the general that in all this winter you have never once been to see me? Oh, General Lee, I answered, I had too much mercy to join in your buttermilk persecution. Persecution, he said, such things keep us alive. Last night when I reached my headquarters, I found a card on my table with a hyacinth pinned to, to it and these words for General Lee with a kiss. Now, he added, tapping his breast, I have here my hyacinth and my card, and I mean to find my kiss. He was amused by the earnest eyes, and he's actually talking to the woman's daughter, not the woman herself. He was amused by the earnest eyes of, of my little girl as she gazed into his face. They have a wonderful liking for soldiers, he said. I knew one little girl to give up all her pretty curls willingly that she might look like Custis. They might cut my hair like Custis's, she said. Custis, whose shaven head does not improve him in any eyes but hers. His manner was the perfection of repose and simplicity as he talked with me. I remembered having heard of his singular calmness, even at Gettysburg and at the explosion of the crater. He had evinced no agitation or dismay. I did not know then, as I do now, that nothing had ever approached the anguish of this moment, when he had come to say an encouraging and cheering word to me, after abandoning all hope of the success for, for the cause. After talking a while and sending a kind message to my husband to greet him on his return, he rose, walked to the window, and looked over the fields, the fields through which, not many days afterward, would be dug into trenches. I was moved to say, you only, General, can tell me if it is worth my while to put the plowshare into those fields. Plant your seeds, madam, he replied sadly, adding after a moment, the doing it will be some reward. I was answered. I thought then he had little hope, and I know now he had none. He had already, as we have seen, remonstrated against further resistance, against the useless shedding of blood. His protest had been unheeded. It remained for him now to gather his forces for endurance to the end. Twenty days afterward, his headquarters were in ashes. He had, left his famished, he had led his famished army to Appomattox, and telling them they had done their duty and had nothing to regret, he had bidden them farewell forever. September 1861, five months after, into the conflict, Mary Borkin Chestnut of South Carolina, one of the war's greatest diarists, wrote, now the men praise the women, unquote. Forty years after the war, Susie King Taylor, the only African-American woman to publish her memoir of wartime experiences, declared, these things should be kept in history. So many lives were lost, not men alone, but noble women as well. Throughout the national drama, that ended the Civil War and redefined American democracy, women, northern and southern, black and white, slave and free, exerted powerful gender, racial, and regional influences on their families. Their families, their communities, and their foes recognized the multifaceted involvement, their multifaceted involvement is having shaped the war's course in the, national, in the nation's destiny. And the works of these three fine scholars and others is reflective of a great historical debt that is still being repaid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now, we've now reached the question and answer portion of our program. Um, when you're recognized, please state your name, your question, and again, reading the script, no speeches, please. <laughs> State your name, question, and if you're addressing it to a particular author, please state that, although we would prefer that you ask questions 
of all three of our authors. So the idea is that you ask the question. I think the authors will be able to hear you, so I don't need to repeat it. But uh, let's 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 get on with the question and answer. This gentleman here. My name is Ray. <laughs> can, can you tell me the, the number of people that were in the pool that you started and the process of elimination for your subjects? That's a good question. Um, first of all, I want to say I like your Philadelphia Eagles sweatshirt. I approve. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I fairly quickly uh, honed in on these four. Uh, my goal was to find, um, like I said, four women who really pushed the envelope. And even if they didn't physically interact uh, all the time, although a few of them do at certain points in the story, it was important to me that there was um, that their lives touched each other in certain ways. For example, they were running into the same people quite often, or there was a cause and effect. One woman's behavior was affecting another woman's circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, Rose Greenhow, with the Confederate spy, was literally watching Emma Edmonds, Private Frank Thompson, drill on Capitol Hill. She was spying on Emma's army, the Army of the Potomac. And her spying affected Emma, of course. Um, and in another scene, uh, Bell Boyd, uh, not surprisingly, told off uh, Union uh, Butler, uh, Gen uh, Benjamin Butler, the Beast, as the South called him. Um, she has this uh, scorching speech, which she lays upon him. And in the very next scene, he's recruiting Elizabeth Van Lu for the Union as a spy. So, so they're all, there's all these little cause and effect. And, um, and uh, th that was a, the big challenge for me. I, I live in 600 square feet in New York City, and I at one point uh, spread my entire manuscript out on the floor uh, to, to find where the puzzle pieces went, um, which my husband wasn't too happy about. Uh, couldn't, he couldn't walk anywhere for a few hours. Uh, but, but that's how I went about my process. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I wanted to write a biography, and I love that genre. And I wanted to study a woman's life in depth. And I would love to do a Georgia woman, being a Georgia woman myself. Uh, and I was very fortunate when I, I went to my advisor uh, when I was in graduate school. This is back in the 80s. Um, and I said, I would love to do a Georgia woman. And do you have any suggestions? And I was so, there were several things that came together. He said, well, there is this wonderful diary at Duke University. Why don't you go look at it? His wife was an archivist at the Woodruff Library in Atlanta, and she had knowledge of this diary. So that was my first uh, good fortune. I went to Durham, looked at the diary, loved it, was able to purchase a type manuscript that fits into seven big loose leaf binders. Then they said, you should go and meet her great granddaughter who happens to live in Atlanta. I went and met her great granddaughter her son was at Georgia Tech, and my husband was the football coach at Georgia Tech at that time. We had a connection. And then uh, her cousin was my seventh grade teacher, of all things. And uh, I worked real hard for my seventh grade teacher, and I was a good girl in that class. So I got good marks. And so she trusted me to tell her great-grandmother's story. And she sent home with me 15 scrapbooks that her great-grandmother had kept after she quit keeping the 41-year diary. And in that scrapbook, those scrapbooks are newspaper clippings that she kept because it was something she was interested in, or she began to write every organization she belonged to, even before she moved to Atlanta, but when she started joining women's volunteer groups, um, church groups, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and the suffrage movement later, she meticulously glued them in those scrapbooks. So I had an, another year or so of research in those scrapbooks, but uh, I was so fortunate. And then I had to do a lot of work in the court records. I didn't have time to tell you that there was litigation in the family uh, fighting over the wealth that was left in this enormously wealthy family. And her husband was so bad off financially that he started borrowing from the brothers and sisters that were more fortunate, his brothers and sisters and her brothers and sisters. And when they could not pay the money back, their brothers and sisters sued them. And those court records, um, 
uh, she was mortified because it was written up in the newspaper, and she talks about this in the diary. And this is when she made the statement, I wish I could, she was alienated from her family. And she said, I wish I could find some strong women, some women who had suffered and grown strong. And I say that she became that woman, and she also met those women. She met uh, Susan B. Anthony, Frances Willard, who founded the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Anna Howard Shaw, the first Methodist minister in our country, and a medical doctor and president of the National Suffrage Movement. Uh, she met Carrie Chapman Catt. She met all of those really strong early leaders of the suffrage movement and um, really had this astounding life. And uh, those three sources were available so that I could trace the spiritual and emotional development of somebody over 60 years and really see how her mind worked and how her she changed. That's a long answer to your question. But. <laughs> I had a very clear set of parameters since I was gathering writing specifically by Virginia women. So um, from, from the very beginning, uh, I, you know, I, I had a set of, of um, standards to, to stick to. Now in terms of um, deciding what actually to use, it was a combination of geography. I wanted the, the Commonwealth represented, so I wanted experiences from from the valley, uh, from uh, the peninsula of Norfolk, and uh, from this part of the state as well. And then I also had to kind of turn a, a, a cold editorial eye upon the manuscript as well and, and try to limit the amount of uh, floweriness in, in, in the writing in favor of, of those pieces which, you know, it, it, had the most artistic, if they didn't have the most artistic merit, they at least contained the most important um, historical knowledge and uh, generated the most authentic sense of um, feeling and passion that these, that these women were experiencing. Yes, ma'am. I know that the women of the Civil War had a huge part in medical in the medical in the care of all of these soldiers can one of you or all of you can you speak to that i know that probably they weren't even nurses but they were caregivers mm -hmm. um actually emma edmonds aka private frank thompson was a nurse um and served as a nurse on the battlefield uh and um and a courier as well and and her diary well her memoir she wrote a memoir um is full of really uh, vivid uh battlefield scenes in which she was rushing out and limbs were falling off. I mean, the piles of limbs that she had to sift through. Um, I mean, just, <laughs> you know, just really visceral, uh, disturbing imagery that she put in there and, and not holding back about any of it. And a couple times where she witnessed people shooting themselves so they didn't get, you know, suicide on the battlefield so they wouldn't, um, you know, they would rather do that than either get captured by the enemy or be shot by the enemy or, to, or I guess, wounded mm -hmm. in a debilitating fashion. Um, there were people who, uh, you know, she witnessed men pretend they were wounded, um, and she talked about that in disgust. She, you know, it was sort of great when she put on this air of bravado, like, you know, she never admits in her memoir that she's a woman. She's very uh, cagey about her name and her gender, um, but she, she, it, it, there were a couple times where she, um, she talks about people not being manly, Mm -hmm. um, and on the battlefield. Uh, so, so it was really interesting to read her experiences and get a sort of um, uh, up close and personal view of, of somebody who was involved in the war in many capacities and, and nurse, nurse being nurse being one of them. Uh, I will say that I, I mentioned that Gertrude probably leaves us the best record of what women went through in childbirth in the 19th century. And in her diary, um, it's she talks about when she's a young girl, they get ether, and they're sniffing it, and um, you know, and giggling and all of that, and playing with ether. This is before she starts having babies, but she talks about the first time that she has anything for pain, and she has chloroform with one of her late later babies, and so you begin to see a little bit. At least women are having something for pain, um, but you realize what they did not have when these babies got sick and 
Uh, today, our grandson got salmonella poisoning, if you can believe it, when he was 17 days old, and we rushed them to the emergency room, and they pumped them through with these antibiotics, and they survived. But back then, those babies would get fevers, and they would be dead in a day or two, and they didn't know why. So you do have a stark understanding of what they did not have that we take for granted today. And uh, Gertrude did go and visit the hospitals. I think all the women just tried to do the volunteer things that they could, and there was a hospital in Augusta, and they would go and do the volunteer uh, work of reading to the men and trying to comfort them, and she describes the gory scenes that she saw, and then at night she would have nightmares. Uh, I, I imagine that would be very, very difficult. There's a, there's a nonfiction scene in, um, in my book in which a, a woman from Norfolk uh, goes to visit her husband who's an officer posted in uh, Richmond and is dressed in, in all her finery. And as she's reaching uh, Richmond uh, from the east, uh, the seven days battle breaks out and so Richmond immediately becomes this kind of um, hospital place uh, for for the wounded and uh, she immediately gets recruited into um, or rather volunteers to help and so here's this woman with with no medical 